Okay, we're not actually doing that. Ah, who could forget good old Gateway? With their CalPrint boxes and their comparatively low prices, these systems provided countless people with their very first computing experiences. And we have three Gateway 2000s here, all from the mid-1990s. And Gateway 2000 was actually the original name for the company. And these are all from the Franklin E. Waste Hall. So let's see if we can give these a new lease on life. All right, first system we're gonna be looking at is this Gateway 2000 in the AT style case. You can see it allegedly has a 486SX25. So we'll see if that's true. Got our reset button here and a turbo button. Have we finally come across a system with a functioning turbo button? We'll see. Got our key lock here. Key lock is stuck in an intermediate position. So hopefully it's not the type of key lock that prevents you from opening the case. If it is, I may have to pick it because I do not have a key for it. Got our five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch floppy drives here. And the classic Intel inside sticker. Unfortunately, it's peeling off a little bit. Left side of the case has the giant IBM style toggle switch for power. And an aggressive one at that. You can see this case has taken quite a beating at some point. And having a look around the back, we unfortunately have quite a bit of rust on this case. Let's hope that's just on the surface and doesn't go too deep into the system. Got our power connectors here. And if you're wondering why these old style power supplies have two connectors, this one is actually for the monitor. That allowed you to control power to both the system and the monitor using just the computer's power switch. Got our 25 pin serial port here. Got our game port here. Got our standard serial and parallel ports here. That's most likely part of an IO card. Got our VGA card here. You can see somebody harvested the screw standoffs from the VGA port. That's no problem. I've got plenty of those. Got a dial-up modem and an Ethernet card. And of course, the AT keyboard port. All right, let's open this thing up and see what's going on in there. All right, got all the screws out, so this case should just slide forward. All right, we've got a complete system here, fortunately. Got the hard drive up there. Got our Intel 486SX CPU. And we are fully loaded with 30 pin SIM modules. However, I do see some signs of trouble. I see one of those notoriously leaky Varta batteries in there. So let's go ahead and get this disc controller out of the way. See how bad the damage is. Let's get rid of that hard drive LED. That's pretty stuck in there. Probably means corrosion. Okay, well luckily the edge connector survived. Got a pretty basic IDE I.O. card. Samsung chipset. Made in USA. Backside looks pretty good. This edge connector should clean up just fine. Now let's get these cables out of the way and see how bad that battery wrecked us. Oh yeah, that battery definitely did its damage. And oddly enough, it has an external battery pack. It's too bad they didn't have the foresight to remove the barrel battery. All right, well, let's get rid of the rest of these expansion cards and get that motherboard out of there. Let's check out that video card. And of course, this IO shield's gonna fall off when I pull it out. So, gotta be ready for that. And it is a Diamond Speed Star 24. Looks like it could be from around 1992. Video memory's fully populated. All right, luckily this is a pretty clean card. Just have to do minimal cleanup of the edge connector. All right, let's check out that dial-up modem. And yep, it's a dial-up modem. Looks like a US Robotics. Got a big old speaker there so you could really hear the dial-up negotiations. Year marked 1995. All right, let's check out that Nick. And it's a Microdyne. Year marked as 1995. I don't have many ISA Ethernet cards, so this is very nice to have. Pretty clean card. Let's put that to the side. All right, let's get this motherboard out of here. Let's get rid of the power connectors. Let's get that external battery out of there. Oh, that's corroded on. Wow, that's not coming off. That's gonna have to be cut off. Let's just pull that thing out of there. Now let's disconnect the connectors for the front panel. Let's get those out of the way. All right, got all those screws out of there, so should be able to just pull this out. And 
here's the underside of the board beneath the battery, and luckily, it's not too bad. Looks like the bulk of the damage is on the top side of the board. So let's cut that demonic battery out of there. Proximity to that dip switch is very concerning. Let's see if they're seized up. Okay, not too bad. That might be salvageable. Let's knock some of this corrosion off these chip legs. See how bad they are. Looks like those are almost completely eaten away. Yeah, it looks like those chip legs are almost completely gone. Well, that's no good. All right, fortunately, that's a pretty readily available chip. Not sure if I have any spares on hand, though. I'm gonna have to look. All right, let's go ahead and extract that RAM. Hopefully these clips don't break. These are all plastic. And luckily none of the battery electrolyte made its way to this side of the board, so I think all these modules are going to be fine. All right, all of the RAM is in excellent condition. And got lucky on the RAM slots too. No breakage. Now let's go ahead and extract that CPU. I'm never more grateful for ZIF sockets than when I'm dealing with these types of CPU sockets. All right, all the pins look good. Let's get that in a safe spot. Oh man, now I'll never get warranty service. We are void. All right, let's get that keyboard BIOS out of there. Hopefully it survived. Mmm, crunchy. Looks like a couple of these pins took part of the socket with them. But fortunately, none of them look eaten. Yeah, those will clean right up. Can't say the same for the socket. That is most definitely getting replaced. All right, let's get that chips chip out of there. Yeah, it looks like we got very lucky. I don't see any corrosion on any of these pins. It means that socket's probably fine too, which is good because I definitely don't have any of those. All right, let's get those BIOS chips out of there. If you're wondering why there's two BIOS ROMs, I believe it was a cost cutting measure because two 8-bit ROMs were cheaper than one 16-bit ROM. No trouble at all out of the first one. And we are good on the second one. All right, now just get the rest of these socketed chips out of here. I like to remove everything that is removable because this board is going to be getting rinsed several times. And the fewer little crevices that have to dry out, the better. All right, now I got to neutralize the electrolyte. And for that, I'm just going to use some white vinegar mixed with distilled water at about 20% concentration. All right, now I'll just give that several minutes to do its thing. Then I'll do the same thing for the other side of the board. Let's just go ahead and snip this battery connector. Since I gotta replace that header anyway. All right, gave that board a good wash and thorough rinse with distilled water. And luckily, it looks like that ISIS slot survived. Looks like the vinegar was enough to clean up the corrosion inside, but I still have to desolder it because I have to inspect the traces that run underneath it. I'm also gonna have to desolder all of these chips that have corroded legs. And for some reason, the vinegar removed all of the markings from this oscillator. Luckily, I took good pictures, so I'll just print out a label or something containing that info, just so the future people don't have to guess. All right, well, I better get to desoldering. Well, I was hoping these were the type of dip switches I could take apart and clean, but these are actually sealed units. I ain't getting in there. So I'm gonna do plan B. I'm gonna let them soak in deoxid. So I just desoldered the chip with all those eaten legs. And oh man. This thing's in bad shape. Well, unfortunately for this chip, I do not have a spare. And I'm not confident that I can solder some prosthetic legs on it. So it seems unlikely that I'll be able to get this board working in this video, but I can at least start on the trace repairs. I am definitely getting my desoldering therapy in today. I don't wanna keep it all off camera though. I'm gonna show you how I remove the ISIS slots. I'll try to make this as quick as possible. First thing I do is lay a bead of flux across all of the connectors. Now I'll take my freshly tinned soldering iron and the desoldering alloy and just melt the desoldering alloy into each one of the joints. Desoldering alloy has a much lower melting temperature than regular solder and when it mixes in it dilutes the existing solder thus lowering its melting temperature and making removal much easier. If you watched my last video it might seem like I'm repeating myself but I didn't want to completely skip over the soldering portion of this video. I just make sure I give each pin a little wiggle so that the desoldering alloy will wick down. It also helps to put a bead of flux on the top side of the board, but that's not usually necessary. Now I like to elevate the board up off the bench with some automotive sockets. 
Then I'll come in with my hot air gun and just run up and down the ISA slot while carefully wiggling it back and forth underneath, just ever so gently. Try not to apply too much pulling force. It's only really necessary to do that if there's corrosion on the board. Usually if this is fresh solder, the sockets will just fall right out. But since we have corrosion on these joints, I'm expecting a little fight. And there we go. And here you can see how the desoldering alloy breaks the bond of the existing solder. It wicks down just enough to get in between the existing solder and the solder pad. And the idea of doing it this way is you get to use much lower temperatures, therefore it's much safer for the board. It greatly reduces your chances of pulling up a pad. Now I'll just use the desoldering braid to clean up those pins. Take the desoldering braid and hook it onto the end of one of the pins. And then just pull it along. It just helps keep your fingers away from it because these desoldering braids can get pretty hot pretty fast. Now one thing to be cognizant of is some of these pins are curved. You can see this one here and these two here. And it's the same way on the other side, which I haven't cleaned up yet. The purpose of those is to help it stay in the slot while you're soldering. So just something to be mindful of. And there we go. Got that all cleaned up. Okay, now it's time to clean up the board, starting at the top side. I'm just gonna run a bead of flux across all of these pads. Then I'll take the desoldering braid and just clean that up. Now it's important to try to avoid dragging the braid itself against the solder pads because that increases the likelihood of doing damage to them. Now most of the holes are still gonna be plugged with solder. So to remedy that, I just use one of these cheap solder suckers. It's basically just a single action vacuum pump just load it like that, and when you're ready to pull the vacuum, just press the button. Just heat up the via, and then... And so on and so forth, until you've got all the holes clear. Alright, now it's time to clean up this Flux Massacre. As always, some IPA and a stiff bristle toothbrush is just the thing. All right, in order to get a more clear picture of what we're facing, I've got to remove some of the solder mask. So I'm just gonna use a fiberglass scratch pen. Oh yeah, we got several broken traces. All right, well the upshot of this is I get to use my new toy. This is actually the first repair I'll be doing with this digital microscope. And I can already tell it's gonna be a whole lot better than my old puny one that I've been using since I used to repair iPhones. I've been using that thing since the days of the iPhone 4, so it was definitely time for an upgrade. All right, well, here's the worst of it. You can see the top side of these pads are just completely gone. Obviously, several traces that are also completely gone. Just slide over this way. And yeah, basically it just continues on like that. All right, let's do some trace repair. And in order to repair the traces, I've just cut some strands of copper wire. That should be plenty thick to carry the current that these traces need to carry. All right, let's just start with this one here. Just get a tiny bit of flux, and then just get a bit of solder on that trace. Let me add just a little bit more flux. All right, that should be enough. Now I'll just insert the copper wire that we cut. I won't worry about soldering it on the top side because that pad is actually fine on the other side. So let's just get a little bend in that. Now let's get some flux on top of that. And then just take the soldering iron and get some solder on there. Now let's come a little lower and get some more flux. And just tin up that trace a little better. and then solder it down. And flux is your friend. Let's just make sure that connection is strong. All right, that's good enough. Now let me just take the 
excess length of that wire and snip it off. And I'll run over that again just so that it looks a little prettier. So now, when I resolder that resistor pack, that via will get filled with solder and we should be good. Now I just gotta repeat the same process for all these other broken traces. Now some of these vias are almost completely gone. I might have to do a bodge wire for this one to the other side of the board. You know, it's been a long time since I've done something this extensive on a board that wasn't in an iPhone. I'm starting to remember all my old tricks. I can actually get through that via. First part of that is I'm gonna take my tiniest drill bit just to clean out the via a little bit. I'm not going all the way through the board, obviously. Now I'll take a sewing needle and poke through the solder mask. And now that should be just enough to get a wire through there. Yep, there we go. Now I'll flip the board over and there it is. Now let's just expose some copper on that trace. Let's get a little bit of flux on that. And I'll go ahead and tin it up. Now let's pull a little bit more of that wire through. And lay that over. Flux is your friend. Now just solder it down. Let's make sure that's strong. Now let's go ahead and trim up the excess. And there we go. Now back on the other side of the board. This trace has a long way to go. So I'm just going to get it roughly in position and then I'll tack it down with some super glue. Now it looks like it runs to this via here, but I don't want to have two wires in there, so I'm just going to connect it to this existing wire that I soldered on earlier. So let's get some flux on that. Actually, let's give that a little bit more flux. There, that's better. Well, that took all kinds of forever. I'm still not finished. But since it's taking so much time, I decided to cut it short. And I'll pick it back up once the replacement chip arrives. And you will be seeing this motherboard again. Since this is now my fourth motherboard for the motherboard repair video, at least we can test the rest of the system. All right, let's get this power supply disconnected from everything. And let's give it a test. I honestly cannot believe these sacrificial hard drives have lasted this long. Well, let's see if this is the power supply that finally does them in. Here we go. Some strange things going on with those voltages. I'm just gonna let it run for a while and see what happens. But with that 12 volt rail being so low, that power supply definitely needs some kind of adjustment. All right, well, we made it past the five minute mark. Go ahead and shut this thing down. All right, well, let's turn our attention to the drives. Pull that hard drive out of there. And it is a Western Digital Caviar, 1.3 gigabytes. The manufacture date of May, 1996. It is of course an IDE drive. Logic board looks clean. Let's put that to the side. All right, let's check out the floppy drives. And that is one filthy five and a quarter inch drive. Spindle's good. Looks like the manufacturer's sticker is behind this rail. I can see it's an Epson drive. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that off. Yeah, there it is, Epson SD600. Now let's check out that three and a half inch drive. Pretty dirty as well. You can see it's also an Epson drive, SMD300. Not much to see on the bottom. All right, let's give these floppy drives a quick sprucing up. I'm just gonna brush them out with an anti-static brush. Not going full tear down on these just yet. Well, this machine has definitely seen its use. Now let's go ahead and pop the top and clean those heads. Yeah, we're a little bit dusty in there too. All right, just using the good old alcohol soaked Q-tip. Let's clean those heads. Oh, they're actually pretty clean. Three and a half inch drive is pretty gross also. Let's likewise clean those heads. Eh, not too bad. All right, let's just do a quick dry fire test of these drives. Power on. All right, sounds like the hard drive initialized. We got nothing weird going on with the voltages, so I think we're good. And the baby AT486 will happily be a stand-in for testing these drives. I swapped in all the peripheral cards from the stricken Gateway 2000. All right, got all the drives connected, so 
Let's see what it does. Hmm, didn't get the usual post beeps. Well, that's not good. Okay, well, I tried cleaning up the edge connector. Also tried using it in a different ISA slot, and same result. There might be a configuration problem. I don't know exactly what these dip switches are supposed to do. So without spending time digging up the manual, I'm just gonna put my VLB video card back in there. All right, once again, power on. Hey, there we go. And I got a seek on both the drives, and they sound delightfully noisy. Okay, it may not be configured to boot from the hard drive, so let's fix that. Oh no, we gotta use type settings. Gonna have to specify these manually. 2484 cylinders, 16 heads. Not sure what WP is, I'm just gonna leave that zero. Landing zone, I'll leave that zero. Then we got 63 sectors. All right, let's see how it likes that. All right, we're booting. What is this? Some kind of network boot thing? Let's try normal. Oh, it's booting some kind of Windows, I think. What is this? Windows 3.1. Wow, there's a lot on this thing. Okay, well, one small problem, though. It didn't detect my serial mouse. All right, got a mouse driver loaded. It's working fine. Let's explore. AOL, of course. Got to open that up. Wow, it's AOL 3.0. <laughs> got a bunch of accounts on here. <laughs> wow, I haven't seen this interface in forever. Gotta look at the email dialog, of course. Okay, apparently we're frozen. <laughs> well, gotta reboot. Oh, the memories. Alright, let's see what else we got on here. Entertainment pack. Oh, Idle Wild. I haven't seen that in forever. <laughs> ah. Oh, no, the stars. I used to stare at this for an inexplicably long amount of time. All right, let's see what else is on here. Tetris, the actual Tetris? Okay, I better not get into this because I'm gonna get lost for hours. Let's see, educational games. Mario? What's educational about Mario? Oh, it doesn't work. No, the Oregon Trail. And no sound card. Yeah, I already knew that. Wow, it looks like it actually does work though. <laughs> okay, I definitely can't get into this right now. Speaking of time sinks... DOS games. SimCity? No way! I think this is the original SimCity. Oh, yes it is! <laughs> Let's see if they've got any saved cities on here. The bomb. Let's see what that's about. Oh, I barely remember how to play this. <laughs> wow, I'm definitely taking an image of this hard drive. I'm gonna have to scrub it from all its personal data, though. Don't tell me they actually paid for WinZip. No, of course not. <laughs> sure, I agree. Oh, man, I remember this. Let's see, WinZip Classic. Okay, I might be getting to nostalgia overload here, so... Let's just take another quick look and see, and then we'll test those floppy drives. What is Lix Tools? Do I even want to know? Of course I do. Oh, okay, some kind of AOL plugin. Hmm, that seems awfully suspicious. I wonder if that's some kind of like booter or something. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yep, it's a booter. I guess back then we called it a punter. <laughs> oh, wow. I can't honestly say I didn't partake in the booter wars. Let's just close that. All right, well, let's drop down the DOS and test those disk drives. What on earth is this? Time to Nigelize. This system's getting kind of weird. Uh, okay. I'll humor you. What on earth? Okay, I guess it's some kind of program executive. Let's see if it has all those same games. Well, apparently it's got a couple of keen games on here. I definitely can't get lost in this right now. Take me to DOS. We have a green DOS shell? Whoa. Ah, oh, man. Someone was definitely heavy into the customization of this thing. Alright, let's get a disc in that five and a quarter inch drive. Now, since the terminating resistor block is in that drive, I'm assuming it's A drive. 
Yeah, it's doing stuff. Doesn't look happy. Ah, oh, general failure. Okay. Try once more, maybe? Nope, gotta fail. Back to C drive. Let's try formatting it. Doesn't look like we're getting far. Write protector? That disk's not write protected. Let me try another disk. Alright, that was a double density disk, so let's try a high density disk. Okay, there we go. Yeah, it's working. Let's see, let's try copying something to it. Something small. I guess net.bat might be kind of small. Alright, it works. Guess that drive's good. Alright, let's try a three and a half inch drive. Oh, data error. Okay, there's no way that's a double density drive. Not in the 90s. Okay, you know what? It just occurred to me that I didn't configure the floppy drives in the BIOS. So let's go ahead and reboot and set those correctly. Yeah, we're still set to 1.4 on the five and a quarter inch drive. No wonder we're confused. Save changes and exit. All right, once again, and we still can't read drive B. All right, fail that. Let's try a double density disk in there. And that's a no. Okay, well, maybe there's some configuration on the jumpers of that drive that have to be set. But for now, let's check out the hard drive. Hey, mouse works and scan disk. That hard drive sounds lovely. Oh, I forgot to pass the slash F parameter, so we gotta click fix it every time there's a problem. Sure, save them. Save it all. All right, let's do a surface scan. This could take a while. Oh, I think we're gonna make it. All right, no bad sectors. This drive's perfectly healthy. All right, let's see what can be done about this rust. I really wanna preserve these labels if I can. So I'm gonna start with some CLR on some steel wool. See what that does for it. Let's just do a small bit here. Okay, well that might work. Let's do a test spot on this label and see if it harms the printing. Okay, doesn't seem to hurt the label. At least not that label. Okay, well, guess I'll continue on with this. Okay, well, it's not perfect, but it's definitely a lot better than it was. I did lose the labels on the ports, but that's okay. All the labels that I care about survived. Well, it didn't turn out quite how I'd hoped. Those Varta batteries are pure evil. Let's move on to the next system. The next system is a comparatively tiny Gateway 2000. Looks like we've got a 486 DX2 at 66 megahertz. Hopefully, got a reset button here and an unlabeled switch here, which actually doesn't do anything. That's very odd. And we have a remarkably unyellowed three and a half inch floppy drive and CD-ROM drive. Got our power button here. And here we are at the back side of the machine. Got a manufacture date of February 8th, 1995. See, it has just about everything you need on board. Got our VGA port here, got a parallel port two serial ports, got PS2 keyboard and mouse ports, and I got some kind of sound card, and of course the dial-up modem. Gotta have that. All right, let's go ahead and open this thing up. All right, it looks like this case actually slides back, I think. Not easy. These old gateways sure had some tight tolerances. All right, now I think at this point it lifts off. There we go. All right, and staring us right in the face is a Sound Blaster Vibra 16. Very nice. And it's got an OPL3 chip. And it looks like this system is complete. Even still has a hard drive in there. All right, let's go ahead and get that sound card out of there. And there's a good look at that. And that sticker has the same manufacture date as the computer. So that must be Gateway's sticker, which means this card is most likely original to the system. All right, let's put that in a safe spot. All right, we're in luck. CPU is still present. Let's just knock some of that dust off so that it doesn't go inside the CPU socket. Now let's go ahead and pull that out of there. Sure looks like a 486 to me. I wanna clean this thing up a little bit, so I'm gonna leave it out for now. And here's a look at the VGA and PCI chipsets. I'm very curious to know what this video feature connector is all about. Maybe it takes an external MPEG decoder or something. All right, let's knock the dust off that RAM. All right, it's kind of an awkward spot. No indication of size or speed at all. And looks like the other stick is identical. All right, let's check out the dial-up modem. Looks like it's retained by this screw and bracket thing. 
Interesting. Oh, check that out. It's actually branded Gateway 2000. So that's got to be original to the system. Pretty standard looking US robotics. Put that to the side. Check that out. We got PCI slots in this thing. I'm liking this system more and more. All right, let's get this power supply disconnected from everything. Well, I'm looking real hard and not seeing a battery yet. Let's see if it's under these cables. Okay. Where is the battery? All right, it's gotta be beneath these drives. Let's just get this floppy cable the rest of the way out. It's stuffed in there. And isn't that the same floppy drive from the last system? I guess maybe Epson was Gateway's OEM for floppy drives. Okay, looks like this drive cage is retained by a single screw. Let's get that out of there. Then maybe it just slides back. Yeah. Well, that was easy. There is our battery. Okay, well, I'm relieved to see it's not one of the evil Varta batteries. However, these Dallas real-time clocks contain an internal battery, and it is most likely dead. However, luckily, it looks like it's socketed. Let me try to pull it out of there. Well, I'm liking this system even more. And we got a year stamp of 1994 on this RTC, so there is very, very little chance that it still works. But you know what? If it's dead, I'm definitely doing the battery hack because I still do not have my modern replacements for these RTCs. So let's actually just stick that back in there for now. And that CD drive has a date stamp of January 1995, so I'm betting that's also original to the system. Did we really just unearth a completely untouched Gateway 2000? All right, let's test that power supply. Got the sacrificial hard drives ready to die as usual. Here we go. All right. Let's just let that run for five minutes or so. All right, five minutes in, we are good. And here's a good look at the hard drive. It's a Western Digital Caviar 2700, 730 megabytes. The manufacture date of December 1994. And it also has one of those gateway stickers with that same date on it. So I'm assuming it's original to the system. And we've got that same sticker on the floppy drive. All right, this floppy drive has something rattling around in it, but I gotta open it up anyway. And I actually kind of love the way these drives open up. You just remove these three screws, and then this entire outer shell just slides back. Okay, whatever was rattling is still in the cage. What is that? It's like a pin for something or other. Good thing we got that out of there. All right, let's just spruce up this drive a little bit. Now let's clean up those heads. Pretty clean. All right, I got everything reinstalled, so it's time for a test. Now I can't test this thing with just any keyboard though. Gotta break out the any key. Have you ever been inexplicably hassled by having to push both the side and up arrows at the same time? Gateway's got you covered. All right, well, let's see what this thing does. Hard drive initialized. And it's posting. Awesome. But as expected, that RTC is dead. Let's see if we can get through without it for now. Okay, just resume. Okay, we don't seem to be doing much. Well, let's try to reboot. Yeah, I don't think we're getting through the bad RTC. Let's see what setup does for us. Okay. Let's try to auto detect that. There we go. All right, save changes and exit. Hmm, operating system not found. It definitely detected the hard drive correctly. Let's try a DOS boot disk. All right, well, at least the floppy drive works. Okay, well, let's see if we have C drive. Nope. Let's see if DOS even sees that disk. No, it does not. Okay, I'm gonna have to do the RTC hack. Done and done. Now, I kept the wire kind of long because I'm gonna have to move that battery off to the side somewhere because that hard drive is definitely gonna interfere. So let's just bend these over. Now I'll take some hot schmoo and just fill these cavities.
Good enough. And yeah, the jank is real, but it'll do for now until I find a fully Cromulan RTC replacement. Alright, looks much happier now. Now let's actually configure the BIOS correctly. Alright. See if it boots now. Oh, there it goes. Alright, we are booting Windows 95. All right, we are in. That hard drive sounds lovely. What on earth is this? Slowly creeping in. Wow. I remember that. That's weird. It usually does that only on the first installation of Windows 95. I wonder if this thing's been wiped. Okay, apparently not. Let's see what's on C drive. Oh, we got all kinds of goodies on here. Quake? Oh, you know I'm gonna open up that. Uh, let's try Q95. I don't think the actual Quake executable works on Windows 95. Okay, apparently that doesn't either. Maybe Q launch? Nope. Okay, well that's unhappy about something. I didn't hear the Windows startup sound. Did we load the sound driver? Hmm. Well, I think that's the only game on here. It's definitely the original Gateway 2000 install. And it has the config program for the AnyKey keyboard. Definitely going to be taking an image of this hard drive. Let's play with that later. Let's see, what's in audio? Wave Studio. See if we can make some sounds with that. <laughs> it's just an engine sound. Alright, well apparently the sound card works. Let's go down the DOS mode and run Quake from there. Oh, here we go. It's running awfully it's running awfully slow. Oh, that's odd. Okay, let's get out of here. Alright, well, let's check out that hard drive. I always forget to pass the slash F parameter. Skip undo. Fix it. Fix it all. Four whole megabytes of data. Save it. Alright, let's do a surface scan. Ah, I see some bad sectors already. Hopefully there's not any more. Well, I think we're gonna make it. No new bad sectors, at least. All right. All right, let's see if that CD-ROM drive works. I think they got assigned D drive. Nope. All right, let's reboot back to Windows. All right, it's showing the AOL icon, so it must be working at some capacity. Yeah, guess it works. Okay, let's not install AOL. instead right click and explore and yeah CD-ROM drive works all right let's shut this thing down ah uh, the sure sign of an AT system all right let's clean off the sticker goo much better all right well I couldn't be happier with how this thing turned out it's basically an all-original system. It's got all the Gateway 2000 countenance in a very nice compact case. And on top of all of that, it's a 486DX with an OPL3 sound blaster. Yeah, this thing's definitely a keeper. Now I just have to find a monitor for it. Let's move on to the next system.
All right, the next system is, you guessed it, a Gateway 2000. This time sporting a Pentium CPU. See, we have quite a bit of damage to the faceplate. It's kind of just hanging on there with that tape. I do have another system with this same faceplate, but it's a 486 system. So I should be able to use that for reference for maybe 3D printing some new clips. And I just love that family PC sticker. That is so wholesome. And of course I got our reset switch here and key lock. Got our three and a half inch floppy drive. And got a quad speed CD-ROM drive. All right, let's go ahead and pull off this tape because I'm pretty sure this faceplate's gonna fall off. And yeah, there it goes. Well, actually, there are no clips on this faceplate. It's kind of hard to see, but looks like just the screws are missing. And that is very good news. All right, having a look around the back, got our nine pin and 25 pin serial ports. Got a parallel port here. Got our PS2 keyboard and mouse ports. Got some kind of video card. Looks like we have the original Gateway 2000 dial-up modem. Got some kind of sound card. And another dial-up modem? Why on earth would they have two dial-up modems? That's very strange. And we got a manufacture date of November 21st, 1995. Now this case doesn't have any screws in it, so I'm kind of concerned about what's inside. But let's go ahead and get this thing open. All right, just like the last system, this should slide back. Should being the operative word. Oh, that was stuck. Okay, now we should just lift off. Let's see, we got a baggie full of something down here. Actually, it looks like it's the screws for the faceplate. Well, at least some of them. Well, that's lucky. However, what's not so lucky is we are missing the CPU. But that's not a huge deal. I've got a bunch of Pentium ones. Looks like the power switch is just dangling around in there. And why does it look like a chicken? And the PC speaker slash fan holder is also just kind of dangling around in there. Let's get that out. Well, it looks like it's also missing the RAM. Well, that's no problem. Now I've got plenty of 72 pin SIM RAM. All right, let's check out that sound card. And it is yet another Viber 16 with yet another OPL3 chip. Getting real lucky today. Looks like it's original to the system. Let's put that in a safe spot. All right, let's see what kind of video card we got. Got an S3 Trio 64, year marked as 1995. Looks like it's also original to the system. Okay, why two dial up modems? I'm trying to think what use could having two connections do you in the dial up days? And it's a very funky looking Lucent card. Let's check out the other one. All right, looking very similar to the previous system. It's a US robotics modem. And this one is original to the system. So maybe they just wanted to stick a 56K modem in there and not bother to remove the OEM modem. All right, let's get these IDE cables out of the way. And unfortunately, we do not have a hard drive. Oh well. And thank my lucky stars, no barrel batteries. Although it still is an evil Varta battery, so let's get that out of there. And in true Varta battery style, it did leak a little bit. Let's get the new one in there. And here's a good look at the chips on the motherboard. I'm not sure, but we seem to be missing something here. I've never seen the inside of one of these machines before, but I wonder if that's where the hard drive is supposed to sit. We do have some screw markings here, which seems to suggest there was a hard drive there, but it seems like a kind of a waste of space up here. All right, let's get this power supply disconnected from everything. Prepare it for interrogation. Hmm, got something in there. Oh, that's a bracket from a heatsink. Good thing I found that. It's a short circuit waiting to happen. All right, sacrificial hard drives in their seemingly eternal servitude. Let's see what happens. All right. Okay, well after five explosion-free minutes, I think we're good. Okay, luckily I have no shortage of donor systems. So I've loaded us up with 72 pin SIM RAM and got a Pentium 1 in there. And I got the faceplate screwed back on. 
no issues whatsoever. Also got that fan cage and the PC speaker back in there. And I got the video and sound cards back in, so it's time to test this thing. All right, here we go. Power on. Oh, that's not good. It either doesn't like the CPU or doesn't like that RAM. Okay, well, let's figure that out. Okay, weirdly enough, it boots with the post analyzer card in there. So that's weird. Maybe it just had the loaded CMOS settings? Who knows? Let's go ahead and get a DOS boot disk in there. See if I can press the any key. And there it goes. All right, that floppy drive works. And what a noisy floppy drive it is. I love it. Now I should be able to toggle turbo mode. So let's see, control alt minus, yep. And turn it back on is control alt plus. That works. Let's test the CD drive. All right, it opens right up. All right, that got assigned R drive. And it works. Awesome. All right, well, let's get a hard drive in this thing. This 341 megabyte Western Digital Caviar from 1994 should fit the bill. Now I gotta get that drive cage out of there. All right, well, let's see what it does. All right, hard drive's detected. Okay, apparently I already put DOS on that drive at some point. <laughs> All right, now it's time to hunt some sound card drivers. Good old philscomputerlab.com. See if these are the right drivers. Now I think we have to run the plug and play driver first, since this is a plug and play card. Install. Continue, continue. All right. Go on. All right. Please remember to reboot your system. All right, now let's do the actual driver install. Okay, this looks promising. Very good. And one more reboot. Sure, it looks like we have an audio driver now. Let's get some games copied over to this thing. Oh, that CD drive can't read a CDR. Too old for that, I guess. Not to worry. The good old CF to IDE adapter will get us around that. And it's detected. Let's see if DOS recognizes it. Yes. Let's just do a quick test. All right, we got Sound Blaster sound. Let's just make sure it works. Oh yes. Nothing more beautiful than Keen 4 music on an actual OPL chip. Alright, let's get out of this. Let's get a real test on there. Let's make sure we're configured. And it runs beautifully. <clears throat> See if the any key directional buttons work, and they do. <laughs> nice. <laughs> 
All right, so that works. All right, well this thing came together and actually turned out to be a pretty nice system. I just gotta put a five and a quarter inch drive in there. And then I have to decide if there's room in my life for two Gateway 2000s. I do have two any key keyboards. And this thing is just too stinking cute. This little 486. I can't wait to find a monitor for it. And this program is made possible by contributions from a patron like you. Thank you. No, seriously, thank you all so much. And if you're new to the channel and this is your thing, be sure to subscribe, because I've got a lot more in the pipeline, including more gateways. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.